Greetings, everybody. This is Christopher Messina coming at you from the Messy Time Studios. We are delighted to be enduring the rain here in Florida, which is a passing phenomenon on November 5th, 2021. Joining us from his uh, countrywide road tour discussing his book, Crypto Dad, is J. Christopher Giancarlo, the former CFTC commissioner, an old friend and colleague of mine who we've worked on some stuff together in the past. So uh, I'm delighted to have him as a guest and uh, welcome to the show. Chris, it's great to be with another Chris, and it's great to be with a good, a dear old friend. It's great to be with you. So, uh, love, love the book. I, I can say that unabashedly. Uh, it's it's hard to write a compelling narrative. It's it's hard to bridge, uh, as we all, those of us in the capital markets, have tried to bridge for you know family and friends who uh, are not in these markets, the complexities therein, and. Um, so the, the storyline for those who haven't read it and will um, is around you know, uh, the, the CFTC getting involved in uh, how to or whether to regulate or to, to permit or not permit uh, futures trading on cryptocurrencies while Chris was, was involved at the CFTC. And he writes about that uh, in the book, but also more forward looking um, for our audience uh, specifically who are kind of focused on you know, everything fairly enough through, through our, our lens is either something adds to freedom or detracts from freedom. Nothing really sits still. So, you know, would love to get your take on, you know, post leaving your role with the new administration, perhaps that's a good jump off point um, without diving into politics. You know, do you see the U.S. moving in the right direction in regards to crypto currently or is there room for improvement? Well, thanks, Chris. That's a great question. You know, I, 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 I wrote the, the book to tell a few good stories and, I, and hopefully people will enjoy just some stories about uh, what it's like to be an accidental regulator going through the, the, the mysterious byways of Washington DC and some of the regulatory bodies around the world. And, and hopefully if I've done my job well, they'll enjoy those stories in their own right. But I, I really wrote the book for, you know, to, with a bigger purpose in mind. And that is to tell people well, not people inside the Washington Beltway or in academic institutions at Harvard or Columbia, but to talk about ordinary people, you know, the, the bookkeeper down the road, the, the dentist that I visit far too often these days, <laughs> uh, and, and ordinary people, so, some, a simple message, and that is that, like it or not, money is changing right before our eyes. Money is perhaps going through one of the most profound changes that's happened in several generations. And the future of money is, on one hand, going to be far more efficient. It's going to be lower cost to use it. It's going to be faster. Hopefully, it'll be more inclusive of our fellow, fellow citizens and potentially have a greater ability to protect our economic liberty. Mm. However, that's a potential. There's also a tremendous potential for our money to be as surveilled as much as our spending habits are today on big tech platforms like Amazon and others. There's the potential for our, our liberty of how we conduct our economic affairs to be subject to government oversight and government prying and, and worse, government censorship. A government that's not afraid to demand that they have access to every transaction we do over $600. <laughs> uh, in a digital future, they may very well want to know where every penny is spent, not just every $600. And so the, the future, the, I call it the fight for the future of money, that fight is being waged today. And hopefully my book is a stirring call to action to private citizens to step forward. You know, it's always the private citizens, the, the middle class that have, that have fought for rights in a democracy and, 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 that, and the rights that we need to fight for of economic liberty, I think are up for grabs once again. And it's time to engage in the fight for the future of money. Amen. Beautifully put. Um, and we saw a little bit of that uprising in Virginia in the last couple of days in regards to other sorts of liberties. Um, the, 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 there's the good news for those of us who are watching those who would like to micromanage our lives is at least they're not hiding their intent. Um, Ken Rogoff has written repeatedly about the fact we have to get rid of cash. And one of his strongest arguments from his point of view is, well, we need to know what people are spending their money on. He writes that unabashedly. It gets published. Mm -hmm. He speaks about it as a professor, and everyone thinks that's a great idea. Um, and you know, we we did a piece on on the six hundred dollars nonsense 
uh, that they're promulgating and beyond the insanity of hyper surveillance of everyone's life, the, not the notion that Janet Yellen put forward that somehow there's $70 billion in unpaid taxes every year from these nefarious $601 transactions is just beyond Orwellian. He would have put a red pen through that. Um, so well, you can even see a point where with digital money, governments can simply say, you know what, we're, we no longer have to have a self-reporting system. We, the government, will decide what you owe us in taxes and we'll just deduct it. We'll, we'll actually just, we'll reduce your digital amount of money from the amount that you thought you owed to the amount we believe you owed, and we'll deal with it after that. Correct. And so there's a lot of concerns. It's 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 more than just surveillance. It's actually censorship. You know, a government. We have government officials today that write letters or uh, send text messages to Amazon saying, "Don't sell these following books online because we don't like the message that's contained in them." Well, you can see if if money is conducted by big technology companies that same type of censorship. And so there- yeah, They just won't let you buy it. You hit click, I wanna buy Alex Berenson's book about uh, you know, vaccines not working particularly well and they just won't let this transaction go through. Right, and if that may sound like hyperbole, well, that's exactly what China's doing with their digital yuan. If you criticize the Chinese government, suddenly your digital yuan will be disabled from getting you a train ticket to leave your village right. or the apartment you wanted or, or worse, a sufficient amount of food to feed your family. Um, and so we all have a stake in what the digital money of the future looks like. It's going digital. And whether it's gonna be provided by a Facebook in the form of a, of, a, of a DM coin, or whether it's gonna be provided by a US government in the form of a digital dollar, all of our money is going digital. And by digital, I mean not digital in the form we have now with digital bank accounts, but accountless systems. Where we, where we have basically the digital form of tokenized money and where it establishment of its validity is done algorithmically through the World Wide Web in the same way Bitcoin is confirmed. But in this case, it would be confirmed by authorized parties that may be uh, banks and, and other financial intermediaries or could be um, uh, government systems as well. And uh, as I say, um, I, I, I believe technology is a given you know it's not inherently good or bad and the notion that if you're afraid of the bad you can stop the technology evolution is foolish it's naive to think that the internet that is so transformed everything we and every way we gather information so transform the way we shop with online commerce so so transform the way we we get about through uh, through local transit and transportation and entertainment and the internet has changed so many things that we know in life, it's naive to think it's not going to do the same thing to banking and money. It is, it's happening already. The question is what values are gonna be encoded in that digital future of money and what are we gonna to have to say about it? I, I like that. One of the things that I've, I thought has been really fun is as Baron Lord Rothschild back in the 19th century said that only four or five people truly understand what money is and, and none of them have very much of it. Right? I think had he lived to today, he would have found that in fact, millions of people have come to understand what money actually is and they all understand it. a lot of them have a lot of it um and, and it is a fantastic transition because for those people who've never had the delight of traveling in a country without any a, a currency that anyone relies upon right the you know water will always find its level so you can put all the bricks you want in the river you're not going to stop the river it's going to go over it's going to go past it so people are going to figure this out the biggest question for certainly for Americans, uh, is are you going to let the government turn everybody into a criminal? You know, Winston yeah. Churchill's great line is a bad law that makes an honest man into a criminal. And by trying to stifle innovation, trying to stifle um, what types of money you're allowed to use, um, there's a real danger there. And I, I don't see, I think one good point to, to kind of look at in this, in this position here, you've got one particular administration and they all differ as they come in. But uh, there's a fight right now that the woman being nominated for the comptroller of the currency role did her PhD in the Soviet Union, and she still refused to hand over her dissertation to the Senate committee, in which she praises the communist system, and she doesn't like it, she wants to remake banking. So you've got potentially someone coming into a position of authority that her express intent 
is to micromanage America's financial lives, which is going to make people flee to cryptocurrencies all the faster. And I don't know if they even realize the irony of that. Yeah, it's it's um, the it, the emphasis is on control, control of money, control of financial transactions, control over Americans' financial affairs. And you know, uh, a lot of times liberty is voiced in terms of freedom of speech, freedom of of religion, other freedom, freedom of assembly. But economic liberty is as critically important to each and every one of our uh, our, our private lives as any of other other freedoms. If we're not free to make economic choices, free or censorship, of course, I'm talking about legal activities, but within that scope, you know, your economic affairs are your business and nobody else's. And they shouldn't, certainly shouldn't be the government's business. They shouldn't be um, uh, uh, Facebook or other big technologies companies' business. Now, we do need to look ourselves in the mirror as a society, though, because we've all been rather relaxed about the way our, our economic data is, comp is, is gathered by uh, our online uh, service providers oh, and we've been insanely companies. lazy about it. It's ridiculous. And, and it's a slippery slope. It's, you know, it, 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 the, the fact that there is, wasn't even more outrage at the proposal to gather information of $600 transactions or, is, is actually quite disappointing to me as, as a fellow American citizen. I mean, America should have been outraged by that. But, you know, it was 9-11 and the Patriot Act and all these, uh, and, 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 you know, TSA security and all of these slow degradations of our, of our liberty that has brought us to this point. And I'm I am truly afraid, Chris, that as we go into digital money, our society and our fellow American citizens are going to be as relaxed about it as they've been relaxed about, you know, Amazon gathering their information. Somebody oh. said if on social media, if you like something 200 times, that platform now knows more about you than even your closest family members do. Yeah. I mean, we're every day we're giving away just boatloads of information about ourselves. And we do it way too easily, which is really a, a concern. It's it's terrifying. I walk into people's homes and if they have a Siri, I tell them to, to unplug it and put it away or I'm leaving. It's it's the I love that. Well, it's not on. Of course it's on because it has to be for you to speak to it. It's 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 unnerving um, the degree to which people have given it up. But we covered this earlier that part of the problem is humans have not evolved to think abstractly. They think concretely, right? And so I ask people constantly, what do you think of the OPM breach, right? 99% of people to whom I say that have, have no, no idea what you're talking, talking about. They don't know, they have no idea. And when I say this event was more dangerous to national security than Pearl Harbor was, they're especially baffled. Like, did I miss yeah. that in my high school you know, history class? So the, the those people who want to restrain freedom they're winning because empirically people are lazy and if you can't see it or feel it it's not a danger until it's too late yeah right it's the uh it's the uh frog in the uh in the boiling uh, pan of water now yeah. yeah when we talk yeah. when you referenced dodd franking in your book and there's some parts of it that made a lot of sense right but there's some parts that were horribly damaging i mean i personally had my business destroyed because of it uh, and Prudential, the big investment house, was uh, uh, giving us a large pile of money to manage on their behalf. And what I find fascinating is that the capital markets, like any other business, are still a person-to-person -person business. And so the guy who actually wrote the check, who made the commitment to invest, who was the head of alternatives at Prudential uh, to, a, to our commodity fund, that, um, that he was eventually told by the Federal Reserve under Dodd-Frank, Prudential was a SIFI, so they couldn't invest in us. His comment was, and he was, as importantly, his life story is at 14, he escaped from Cuba with his family to come here. And when that happened, he exploded. And he said, uh, he said, I fled a communist dictatorship in my youth. At least it was warm there. Right. And so, I mean, he was in a rage. It's like, what do you mean I, as the 25 year veteran, experienced in, in investment management have decided to give $100 million to this commodity fund and some random bureaucrat shows up and says, oh, you can't do that for the good of the country. Madness. Um, and it's, it's, and when you tell that story to people outside the industry, right? The, the look I see in people's eyes is there must be something you, you're not telling me. Surely the government can't be that capricious and arbitrary, right? But 
you know, we've seen those knock on effects repeatedly and we're going to see it here potentially. Um, either people are going to instantly flee the U.S. kind of through a VPN or through, through reality and move their financial affairs offshore. Um, maybe that's an important point to touch on, right? How would a comprehensive surveillance state try to control electronic money? Like the Chinese have got a ring fence around their interweb, right? It would be really difficult in America to try to really constrain and micromanage. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I, I don't think we're at that stage. I think we're at a stage of something between, so, so the, the innovation is not coming as it never does from uh, the official sector. The, the innovation is coming from the private sector. I think we're at a stage right now where the government response ranges from indifference to fearful hostility. Uh, uh, it, unfortunately, it doesn't seem to include, except with a few rare voices like Hester Peirce at the SEC and others, does the range of government response range to, wow, here's a, an opportunity for us to modernize what is effectively a very creaky, inefficient, exclusive, under-inclusive, expensive rent collecting financial system. Uh, if, if, if our regulators, as an enlightened um, US government did in the 1990s under Newt Gingrich's uh, Congress and Bill Clinton's White House, and welcome the first wave of the internet with a policy of first do no harm. If we were to take that approach now, I think this wave of innovation in cryptocurrency and stable coins and blockchain could be very much serve us to make our economy that much uh, bigger, that much more efficient. You know, China both is using their new digital yuan as both the means to further communist control everything you and I just talked about that we fear, but also for capitalist aims to actually send their economy into fast forward. They view a digital yuan, which is their currency, as a, as a Microsoft operating system for the world's first truly digitally networked global economy. Hmm. You know, in our financial system, we have a series of silos. You wanna trade a share on the New York Stock Exchange you go to a stockbroker. You want to put on a, uh, a hedge on oil prices. You go to what's called the Futures Commission merchant in a different regulatory scheme. You want to do a commercial loan transaction. You're talking to a different uh, service provider. It's a series of silos, one silos. And there's no linkage between the silos except for the common usage of the dollar. But the dollar isn't, it doesn't, doesn't network the system. It just is a means of, of influence of one from the other. China sees a digital yuan as the actual operating system to network all of these functions in the economy, taking out enormous amount of cost of what's called latency or slowness. And it can take the world's fastest growing economy and take out that cost and send that economy into to hyperspeed. Right. It really is a broad vision of the potential of digital currency. We, you know, Chris, you're as familiar with this as, and I'm sure your listeners are. Look around us, our bridges and our tunnels and our airports and our railroads that were once state of the art in the last century have fallen behind the times. They're archaic, they're decrepit, and they're no longer state of the art in our global standard. At all. Well, the same is true about a lot of our financial system. Our financial system is as creaky and as rusted and as deteriorated as that physical infrastructure. And unfortunately, our regulators, rather than seeing this new wave of innovation as an opportunity to modernize that system and improve it and bring it up to a 21st century standard, instead see their mission more as protecting the old legacy system, defending it against technological challenge. And to your point, what that means is that technology is just like that, ro like that roaring river is just going to bypass us here in the United States and go where it can be developed elsewhere. Yep. It's such a disappointment for, for a nation of, of aspirational people, of entrepreneurs, uh, to see us in a state right now where fearfulness seems to be the guiding light for our response to this technology rather than you know, ferocity and, 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 and uh, uh, 
aspirational uh, approaches to it. We embraced the first wave of the internet, which was the internet of information. We set out the second wave of the internet, which is the internet of things and fi- the development of 5G technology where the United States is not even on the, yeah. on the radar screen of, of developers. And the question is, what are we gonna do about this third wave of the internet, the internet of value? And I'm afraid it's worse than sitting things out. We're just fearful of it. And we're being very defensive. It really is a, a, a huge disappointment, Chris. Yeah, and these yeah. are things I write about in my book that I think your readers will find very interesting. Oh, listeners they, they, will find they, very they, interesting. Absolutely. And you put it very eloquently. And the, the headache that I have is, as a student of history, right, is, 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 there, is there anyone shouting is shouting into the wind going to change anything, right? The, the small number of Roman senators who are like, our entire, we've outsourced our entire bodyguard system to a bunch of Huns. They now live here in Rome. I don't think they're going to keep working for us forever. We treat them like this. We're told by 99% of their colleagues to shut up. I got to go to the theater, right? So I don't even know if there is a chance of it, of it, of it, being proactively fixed in the intelligent way that you suggest, right? Um, you know, the, the, the for a great real world example right now, I got a call this morning from a, a investment banking friend who said, I've got a client who needs to move basically 50 container loads worth of Bitcoin mining equipment out of China. And I need to find a cheap power source. And they call me because being in mining, I know a lot of people in hydropower, right? Where can we put this? They're willing to pay a lot to move it because the Chinese have made Bitcoin mining illegal. Of course, they've made it illegal for non-favored people within China. So that's the problem of a one-party state is if you're you're handing over the briefcase full of diamonds to the right person once a week, you get to keep doing what you want to do. Everyone else can't. And I'm I'm terrified that you will enter that Soviet-like system where there's a set of rules but if I'm connected, I can get around it. And that will just grind us to a halt. Yeah. And by the way, you know, China didn't ban crypto and Bitcoin because it doesn't work. They banned it because it's brilliant. Because it works. And, and, and they want to own it. And so right. they want basically to, to, to end any competition to their digital yuan, which is going to be their version uh, of crypto. It's, it's not that, that they see any flaw in it. They, they actually recognize the power of digital money, unlike I think some of our leaders here in the United States that don't see the power of it. Now, I am worried that that the the efficiency of digital currency, the um, uh, uh, the, the its oper- its operation on a 24/7, 365 day a week basis, its ability to move money around immediately and efficiently and, and at low cost, is going to be so attractive that our fellow citizens are going to embrace it, which is a good thing, but embrace it at what cost, what cost in their liberty, whether they give up information to big tech vendors of digital money or to government vendors of digital money. And ultimately in the book, where I come out is saying maybe the best approach is to have competition between government and private vendors of digital money to keep each other honest. I hope some provider of digital money will come along, whether that's our government that recognizes its obligations under our Fourth Amendment's protection of privacy, mm-hmm. or a digital vendor, a non-sovereign that says, you know what, we will give you undertakings of the security of your information. And so the best result may be a competitive result that may be the best defender of our liberty. But unless our fellow citizens really make this an issue, Chris, my concern is, it becomes low on the priority list and not uh, uppermost. Well, I, I, it's interesting. I take a slightly different view, optimistic view, in that those people who already take advantage of it are just doing it and they're not saying anything, right? So, if you want to, you want freedom. Freedom also means freedom to be negatively impacted, right? For for centuries, you chose your bank based on the reputation and soundness of your bank. For 95 percent of Americans, whatever the number is. If your cash in the bank is below the, the FDIC adjusted to 250 grand after the 07, 08 housing crisis, later recast as a financial crisis, uh, you don't care. Like you, Americans have since FDR been divorced from the consequences of their bank's decisions, right? So to them, the bank is this wholly safe place and they, they don't have any idea of the actuarial realities. They don't have any idea of what uh, uh, the government repeatedly bails out the savings and loans. The fact that the PBGC exists is an atrocity. 
right? For those Americans who are not paying attention to what goes on in Washington, this is how we get here. A special interest group gets in, borrows in, gets legislation, and it benefits just them and no one else. So for those people who are already deciding to use crypto cash from vendors who don't ask for any information about you, well, now you're bearing the same risk as you used to bear if you had gold coins in a chest in your, in your farmhouse, right? You had to protect it. And if someone stole it, they stole it. But you're free from surveillance. So that balance, people have, was Ben Franklin's great line about you know, giving up some of your liberty for, for, for safety, you end up with none. Um, but people make that trade off daily, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's Amazon's got all my like data. But if someone mistake, if someone steals it and buys a $900 item on Amazon, an entire network of banks and MasterCard and Amazon don't hold me responsible for it. So I got a little bit of security there. It's, it's making the case for, for freedom has been, has been hard because the downsides seem abstract, even though you can look at Venezuela and Cuba today and say that could be us. And I just don't think, I don't think people connect the dots. I don't think they see it until it's too late. Absolutely right, Chris. Absolutely right. And that's that's why I created something called the Digital Dollar Project, because I'm convinced that that governments, including the U.S. government, are going to go down the digital money route. And I and there's got to be a private sector forum that becomes something of the conscious to this effort of saying, look, this, these are the norms that the American people expect. These are the values that the American people expect to be encoded in digital money. Yep. And we're going to be a spokesman for them. We're going to bring private sector actors together and voice those concerns. My bigger worry is that the government is sort of asleep at the switch now, but then wakes up three years from now and says, oh, my goodness, China's succeeding with this. Europe's launched a digital euro. There's a, a, a digital pound. We need a digital dollar. And they cobble something together overnight. And it passes Congress the way we've seen a few other initiatives huh. come up in recent days where... And so the digital dollar project's meant to get out in front of that and be a voice for the private sector in what are those social norms and what are those public values. Yeah, hey, when you're touching on that, is it a comprehensive revamp? Like for example, there's no reason, the, the very fact that an entire industry called title search and title insurance exists in this country is a bizarre anachronism. The fact that Title theft, meaning people just walk into a house that's unoccupied, the people are on vacation or maybe it's a second home, and they pretend to own it and then they sell it. Like that happens daily in America. And, you know, friends, for example, in New Zealand, a much smaller country, the lawyer there was asking me, how is that possible? We have one registry. That's it. There's one nationally. You, you buy or sell a property. It's like it's got a, a security symbol attached to it. And there's a, there's a record of it. We do that in a distributive fashion too, but like, is the digital dollar project focused on, you know, money writ large, meaning things like title insurance shouldn't exist because if it's on the blockchain, there's there's no title to insure. There, here right. it is. Here's the consensus. Right. David owns it. Now he's selling yeah. it to Bob. So you're right. So, so first of all, that's not within the direct side of the digital dollar project, but it is in the direct uh, crosshairs of a lot of folks. I mean, and it's going to be a difficult one. And why is that? Well, because you know our states were formed first. Um, and they have sovereignty. They have authority over land matters, and and those land those interests are very powerful uh, in congressional districts. You know, sometimes in a a small rural congressional district, the, the title insurance company may be one of the most important jobs and, and they, they'll spend money on the congressional races to make sure their right. interests are well represented. That's going to be a hard uh, vestige of a traditional land-based state, a federalist-based system to overcome. The blockchain, though, is a very powerful tool to overcome it, makes logical sense, and could save us all a lot of costs and money uh, on land transfers. Uh, but I think that's one that's going to have to work its way through some legacy political issues that may take some time. But our digital dollar project is really focused on uh, a central bank digital currency here in the United States and what to help the Fed think through what some of the issues would be involved in rolling out such a digital currency. And as a, economic privacy and anti-censorship are just two of many, others have to do with issues of do you, do you maintain the two-tier banking system? How do we 
in, in, a, in a new form of money that's going to be devastating for the correspondent banking system, mm -hmm. um, how do we preserve the fractional banking system that is still so important for the formation of small and medium-sized businesses, for homeowners to afford their next home and, 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 and other consumer, large consumer purchases? So uh, we definitely want to preserve fractional banking, which plays an important role in the American economy. But, but correspondent banking seems like a vestige of the 19th century. And the amount of our GDP, one or 2% that goes every year, just to moving money around the globe. Oh, madness. Right? Madness. You know, we, we've gone to a world of photography without having to pay a, a Kodak, a, a, a VIG for developing every photograph, right? right. Well, why are we still paying a VIG to financial institutions to move money around? Why are we paying seven, seven to 17% for global remittances? You know, why are we waiting three days to put cash a check and paying fees for doing so? So so this new technology is going to be uh, very disruptive on those legacy rent collecting aspects of our financial system, but ultimately very good and powerful for our fellow citizens. And it's and it's these advantages that new digital money brings that I'm afraid will blind us to perhaps some of the trade offs in terms of surveillance and uh, economic uh, security. Absolutely. Now, is that something that that just anyone you put up white papers? Do you have kind of surveys and stuff that anyone can get involved with from you know some small degree to a voice and opinion versus very deeply Absolutely. involved? So I, I encourage your 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 viewers to check out our website, digitaldollarproject.org. Digitaldollarproject.org. We'll put that now, in the all our information's there. There's a place to uh, put in comments, to reach out to us. We've just named a terrific executive director, Jennifer Lassiter, who okay. was uh, with um, uh, the FDIC and um, and before that CFPB, the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau. And Jennifer is just a ball of fire and, and really smart on these. And she's really uh, hitting the ground running. It's great to have her on board. That's awesome. Good choice. Um... So uh, I, I know you're, you're you're running between events and and uh, you're a very popular guys. So appreciate it. Uh, is there any sort of really biggest ticket thing? If someone had to, in, in all the busyness of the day and living their lives and deciding whether to quit their jobs or get jabbed the ninth time, uh, is there? Uh, you know, I don't have to worry about that here. The last free state in America, thank God for DeSantis. Um, but are there? <laughs> uh, is there one sort of really punchy message because it's. The, the my contention has been in, in a lot of the work we've done is that we try to cut through the noise yeah. because those who want to control and oppress you thrive on complexity. They love yeah. it. There's a reason why the adjective Byzantine became one, right? There's, there's a reason why they love it. They love complexity, complicated rules, and all this nonsense. Is What would be your guiding principle for anyone who has, a, has their congressperson's ear for 10 minutes or 10 seconds? Yeah. So what should they uh, you're absolutely, I said, look, this is this is actually really simple, Chris. Money is changing before our eyes. Money, money is going to change as dramatically as shopping did and as photography did, as entertainment did. It's going to change. Um, the question is, will it change in a form that enhances our liberty or will it change in a form that diminishes our liberty? And the deciders of that are going to be you and me and your listeners and our fellow citizens. The time to make our voices heard and say, yes, we embrace, embrace technological change. We're Americans after all, of course we embrace technological change. We embrace the modern, we embrace that, but not at the expense of our personal liberty. We will not stand for government surveillance and worse censorship of our economic affairs, nor will we stand for it by big technology companies as well at the, that do that at the behest of big government. Economic liberty must be secure in the digital future money, a future that is coming. There's no stopping it. It's coming. We all need to assert our liberties in everything that, every aspect of it. And that's a simple message. It's, it's a good one and it's a complex one. I mean, just to touch on that and relatedly, right? Economic freedom, freedom of speech. Uh, most Americans don't understand what section 230 means in the, in the internet law, which basically gives big tech the best of both worlds. They get to censor what they like, but they don't get to be held responsible the way for, for liable, the way a publisher and editor of a newspaper would be. And that has got to end. We ourselves at Messy Times, we won what I call a woke big tech Pulitzer, where uh, a colleague, uh, David Alvarez, an old friend from ICAP, and I yeah. had a debate about 
mask mandates, whether they made any sense, right? He took the, I like the mask mandate approach. I took con, right? Back and forth, a debate about whether it makes sense, reasonable day. It racked up 40 views in about two hours. And I woke up the next morning to an email from YouTube saying it had been taken down because it violated YouTube's policy on spreading medical misinformation. And when I asked about what that meant, and this I think ties into the whole freedom of money argument, because all one big thing, right? When I asked what that meant, what standard I violated, they said, well, anything that violates your local health authority and the World Health Organization. I, I wrote back, well, that's fascinating because Ron DeSantis's Florida Health Authority has said that mask mandates are pointless. So you like the Chinese Communist Party's who authority? Again, if some kid in Cupertino had been told to click no on masks, right? But the point is they have that power to do that. They yep. can silence you. And that's the same thing as not allowing you to buy something you want to buy. Well, how, how much of a jump is it to go from that to say, you know what, your digital money will be disabled from buying ammunition? Yep. Right? How, how, how much of a jump is it from that? Not a jump at all. Easy, right? Right, easy. E jump. easy. You don't even have to outlaw ammunition. You just disable digital money from buying it. And, it, and, and I had somebody say that. to me, Pay, you I had somebody say to me, PayPal okay, to no problem. A firearm. I'll just stick with cash. And my response is, but what if government gets rid of cash? Right. Once there's digital cash, they can easily get rid. They hate cash as you began. Hate Ken cash. Said, oh, they Let's hate get rid it. of cash. So again, Chris, we have, you know, free citizenry needs to fight every generation once again for its liberties. Yeah. The fight for the future of money is being waged right now. And it's time for free citizenry to settle up and, and, and get ready to get in this fight. And that's why I wrote my book, uh, Crypto Dad for the Fight of Future of Money. And I hope, I hope your readers, uh, I hope your listeners will grab a copy and read it. Amen. We can't, we can't suggest that more powerfully. So um, thanks for fighting the good fight on our behalf. Uh, you know, I hope that everyone else rallies around it, right? People are inundated with calls for their attention. Um, hopefully they get this one. I think a lot of people are. So uh, you, I've got a copy right here. There it is. <laughs> There's the book. And it's beautiful. Grab a copy. <laughs> copy. We'll do. Okay, Chris, thanks so much for, for spending time today. Really appreciate it. Uh, safe Great travels. You, Chris. And we look forward you to too. having you back on when you pass the 3 million bookmark book sales. Well, I, then... I look forward to that myself from your lips to God's ears. Let's do it. <laughs> we'll do. All right. Take care. All right, my friend. Bye, everybody.